<clears throat> not the fanciest setup going. Uh, checking my vote. Yeah, not the fanciest setup here for uh, a Saturday morning in New York City. I decided to do one early. Do a video early. For what reason? I don't feel like doing one later. I think I'm going to watch some football. I have like six different mixes to do and a couple of different little production projects to do. And uh, so I decided morning it is. And so as the sunlight kind of screws with me and my my fancy lighting rig, um, got the notes, I need notes. Uh, remember, exfoliate. It is, it is rough out there. I don't know about you, but my skin is, is, uh, it's like the surface of the moon, something like that. Um, so been up to a bunch of stuff this week. Uh, thank you for watching all the new YouTube videos, the slow down the quick stuff. And, uh, the last segment that I did, which was some the usual random stuff. Um, and it seems as though it may have struck a nerve with some on some of the topics, uh, particularly are the Grammys rigged? That's one. The Lana Del Rey Lord girl in red debate that I self debated. Um, I got some interesting feedback on that from different people, text messages, DMS, phone calls. Um, <clears throat> I'll probably do some more of those, uh, on the, on the music tip. It's, it's something that came up last night. Again, I was, I was during the week I had been surfing YouTube and I came upon a, um, a documentary on the band Kansas, which goes back to my, you know, teenage years of being a music fan and I, and it even got me somewhat into playing the guitar or the band did when dust in the wind came out which i think was 77 um you know if you were just starting to play the guitar or right, maybe i started playing guitar in 78 so it had already been around so when when you started taking lessons back then or trying to learn how to play the guitar uh, Dust in the Wind and Stairway to Heaven were two required noodlings to try and get, you know, get your guitar teacher to, um, to teach you how to play that, you know, and you could, at the time it was di much different than today, as far as the accuracy of all the instruction that you can get from YouTube, from your guitar instructor that was down the street at some little music school, you got a somewhat strangely interpreted version to play of uh, any songs that you would ask to play. I remember he, the first song I learned was Jet Airliner by, um, learned, sort of learned, was Jet Airliner by Steve Miller Band. And it was really difficult, um, way over my head. And then I realized, or I learned, Years later, when I kind of revisited the song, when I could actually play the guitar well, or well enough, um, that my guitar instructor taught me this bastardized version, which was actually harder than the real version, because the real version, the guy used a capo. And if you know what that is, like, if you don't know what it is, it, it allows you to put a... Uh, a moving fret so that you can play the song with different open fingerings and things like that. So this guy didn't show me that. And I learned it with all, without any of the open fingerings and it was torture. Um, maybe he was trying to get me to quit back then. It was, it was just different as far as learning. I mean, sheet music was terrible. None of it was accurate. There was no such thing as tab. The idea that someone can't learn guitar now or learn an instrument now is nuts because there's so much, information at your disposal 24 7 as you could as much as you could stay awake and stare at a screen you could learn every technique and see exactly how some guy played 
a particular riff by watching a video of him, if not him actually teaching you how to play his own riffs. Um, what I would have given to have someone show me the right way to play, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin tunes, you know, and now you could practically, you could learn them by the time you're 10 years old. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. So on that, the, the Kansas documentary, um, excuse me, it's a really good story. It's on YouTube. It's free. As far as I know, it was free. I definitely didn't pay for it. Um, you know, they started out in Topeka, Kansas, uh, in the middle of nowhere, just putting together different bandmates that they, you know, who knows this guy, who knows that guy, can we, um, can we steal this guy to be in the band or like talk to this other dude into being in the band? They, they formed this, this core, which was, I guess, about six guys, which was an enormous band to deal with. And, uh, they had no access, nothing like today where you can upload your own stuff. So they were sending cassette tapes out, I believe, and, you know, looking for some sort of a way to get some attention. They eventually did by way of some guy who knew someone in New York, who knew someone. They put together a really crazy gig in Kansas where they offered free beer to people so that they could pack the place when this record label guy was going to come and see them. And uh, the guy showed up, which, you know, there's many stories, including I've been in bands where like we were, we were supposed to have someone show up from a record label. Uh, you know, tonight's the night, you know, the, the guy's coming, the A&R dude is coming and tonight's the night you're going to, you're going to go from playing to a couple of hundred people to like, you're going to, you're going to be a rock star. And then the guy doesn't show up. Um, that's kind of a, you know, oh yeah, I, I had too many drinks when I was at this other bar and then I couldn't make it down. And as it turns out, it's usually these A&R guys were working bands for nights out. So they were like, oh, okay, tonight I need to get, uh, I need to go out and drink for free and hang out and get my butt kissed by a band and their, their friends and family. So I will make believe I'm going to go sign this band. And, uh, you know, and then when I'm done with that one at nine o'clock, I'll run over to the next place at 1030 and get my butt kissed again. It's kind of, it was a good, good racket. So as I ramble, um, the Kansas documentary, I mean, there was many times, it was just like goosebumps, just, you know, as these guys progressed and went from just near failure and catastrophe and as far as you know just being dumped by their record label the the guy that was backing them from the label had already invested up to somewhere near a million dollars in them in 1970 something so it was a ton of money and they were just about on the brink of being done um and carry on my wayward son was written and then another couple there was carry on my wayward son and there was another one and i and that had dust in the wind on the record also and that just you know i think people even even kids today know what dust in the wind is when they hear it probably from some movie or something but it is one of those world famous tunes that is never going to go away and it's still something that people play when they pick up the guitar and learn this. And it, it turns out it was a, it was a finger exercise. It's like a chord finger exercise that the guy was working on. And his wife said to him when she would come by the room, like, Hey, you know, that's, that sounds like something. And he's like, it's nothing. It's a chord progression exercise. And then she said it again. And, I, and then he decided, well, maybe there is something there. And he, he turned it into a song with lyrics and melody and all that kind of thing. Um, so it's another thing I, you know, I, I talk about for young artists or new artists, even current artists that are, that, that are obviously in the public eye or, or already out there. Like, I don't understand why people aren't putting out more content. There's, 
it's so easy to be prolific these days because of the access to to tools studio tools um instruments uh, getting sounds using beats and loops and uh, software programs and workstations and being able to literally write records on your and or record records on your phone in a lot of ways i don't really get the idea that someone would be putting out and i'm not speaking to anyone specifically that i'm friends with and generally but the idea that you you couldn't be cranking out 30 40 songs a year to me is, is just kind of surprising um I, I would think that you could I mean, even if you were putting them out in a, you know, somewhat humble fashion with the concept that you would rework things and re-release things and refine things, and instead of trying to create this, this proverbial shocking, you know, magic moment where like your song that you worked, worked on for four months, you're going to upload it and, um, you're going to take the world by storm, I think is not worth the four month wait. I mean, if, if you could get the song together, make it presentable, you know, don't be ridiculous and, and put something out that's not presentable, make sure it's somewhat valid and then just put it out there. Um, and then if it, first of all, if it takes off, it takes off. If it doesn't, or it gets some sort of varied response then you can refine it you can revisit it you could rework it you could do the, the remix you could do the new version um there's all of that or in the meantime you could also be putting out 20 tunes and and seeing what works as an artist as you try and get the art out there and find your voice um and that like i think that goes for like i said established artists too like they spend so much time worrying about the machine and and the promotion and what about my you know how are we going to market this record and how are we going to make sure we get numbers as soon as it comes out and blah 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 i mean there's plenty of huge life-changing records that have come out that take six months to a year before it finds its audience. And sometimes that could be because you put out a song, it doesn't really get enough attention or doesn't get any attention or flies under the radar. Um, and then three months later, you put one out that sort of cracks open the door on that attention. But meanwhile, that when that door opens, the audience goes back a ways and finds that song from three months ago that you thought was a little bit more magical and they find it and they discover it. So, you know, I know that, uh, every artist that I work with, like, you know, they love the, the very last song that they've just worked on is like always their favorite song. It's never 10 songs ago because as artists, the creative thing you you just kind of have a tendency to be like okay this is the new this is my new baby this is my new favorite thing this is the puppy um and uh, i don't even want to listen to my old stuff because now this is where i'm at um i, I don't want to play it i don't want to you know that I, i've worked with plenty of artists who record particularly independent artists they'll work on some uh a batch of tunes they'll put an ep out they'll be all jazzed up about it they'll be very excited and pumped up to get out there and promote it and then they do that for a month or two and then all of a sudden the record release party um buzz is over the the this is my new record buzz is over and they go into a little bit of a depression of like oh wow now i don't have like a new record it's just my old record, which is, you know, all of three months old. And they 
next thing you know, they're all of a sudden they're like not playing songs from that when they do shows because they're like, oh, I have new tunes now and I'm bored with those. But meanwhile, the, the audience that they're nurturing along that they're hoping is going to come with them for the long ride, um, it gets disappointed because they're like, you know, where's that song? What, what happened to the song that, uh, you know, drew me into this band six months ago or four months ago? Now you're bored with it. So you don't want to, you don't want to perform it live and you don't want to, you don't want to put new versions of it out on YouTube, uh, you know, acoustically or like the tiny desk kind of thing, or, you know, the stripped down version or how I made this song. You're done with it. You move on. And then you expect your audience to be interested in your new stuff, even though you have actually even shown that you're bored with your old stuff. So it's, um, it's quite the rant there, but, uh, it is what it is. It, it all started with the, you know, questioning as to why artists aren't prolific these days. Um, I, I think back to the Kansas documentary and this guy, Kerry Livgren, that was writing all these tunes. And I can only think like, you know, when he was in, in his twenties writing this stuff, like if he had access to all the stuff that we have access to now, this guy probably was, would have written 30 songs a week because he was just banging it out and then bringing it to his band. And, you know, they were working out these tunes and they said, he said at one point in the documentary, he didn't, it, it was like every day was a new tune that he was coming to the band with. And they were like, they were like, where's this coming from? You know, where it was coming from was that he had put the, he had put the, uh, the work in and built up his craft to the point where he had, he had, he was doing everything on intuition. And, uh, that's when you're in that, that that's when you get into that sort of like flow, you know, where things really come along. Um, what am I going to be working on this week is, uh, I have a new artist I'm working on, a couple of new songs with. She wrote, I'm producing, recording, mixing, um, doing another project for an app where I am creating music for the app. And hopefully this thing takes off. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's a little bit of a uh, music making app. And then I am working on more slow down the quick stuff. I think there's going to be a new video slash music release end of the week. And, uh, there is new stuff already on Spotify. I'm not sure if it's, it's at least four this year already. And there's probably, like I've said before, several in the, uh, in the coffers that are getting reworked and sort of re-manipulated. I have to kind of uh, integrate a new computer over the next couple of weeks, which is going to be, you know, hopefully not a big deal. Um, remember to exfoliate, like I told you. Um, it's very important. I hopefully it doesn't show up on my video that, uh, that, you know, things are taking a toll. Lack of sleep, too much caffeine. They said too much caffeine is bad for the skin. Um, I'm going to, um, also talk about the idea that artists aren't doing enough demos of their, their tracks. In other words, as soon as they start and, you know, for a, a new artist, for someone who's new at production and new at writing, the idea that you would, that the first draft is actually <clears throat> the record is kind of nuts. I think if you get into the point where you're doing music for several years maybe and you're you've established that you know how to put together a full record um you know production wise recording wise all that um then i don't know if you need necessarily to do the demo but um you know major 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 artists start with a demo um, and I've started with the demo. So it doesn't hurt to go back and look at what 
someone did who was successful or has been successful and say like, well, what did this person do? Oh, wow. They did, they did demos. They, they use a cassette, you know, you don't have to use a cassette tape anymore. You can use your phone. Um, they scratched out the idea on the phone. Then they, then they went into, you know, now you can go into garage band and work it up a little further and then you could do it again and then and refine it maybe change the key change the tempo rework the melody all these sort of things rewrite lyrics i mean bruce springsteen is famous for rewriting lyrics and rewriting lyrics and rewriting lyrics and refining making sure every um line is meaningful and connects and maybe is a little you know can be a maybe that line could be a little bit better but the idea that every idea, I've said this in a previous video, not every idea is a great idea, um, regardless of how excited you get or how excited other people in the room try and act, every idea is not a great idea. And you have to be able to um, get a feel for what is and what isn't. Um, and hopefully you're on the mark. I think there's there comes a time where you are you might get in a role and you know your your decisions are onto it um, and connecting and your intuition is is hitting on all cylinders. You're kind of a you know in the uh, the zeitgeist kind of thing uh, in, in a sense that you're in tune with the the audience and and um, those are times where you got to really blast through and do a bunch of stuff um, if you are feeling like you don't know what's going on with your with your tracks or with your music that's the time to do the demo and and be able to sit back and go like hey you know what I'm not trying to make the record right here this is the scratch rough draft this is the first time putting stuff down on the page and I know I'm going to rewrite this chapter but I want to see if I get a feeling from it you know some emotion from it or some sort of indication in your gut that like yeah this this is a this is a tune that I want to further explore or is it something that you don't and when and you might want to put on the shelf for several weeks but you know each day or month or week you could keep read circulating these things um it brings to mind to some tom petty stuff that i've read in that you know the guy was like just constantly reworking 20 to 30 songs um and now the lighting is changing it's uh it's winter you know like we get like i don't know an hour of sunlight i mean it's interesting looks like it looks like it moved to a night version and now the sun's coming back I'm big on feeding birds out my window lately. Uh, even though the, the little fucking squirrel is like starting to steal all the little little breadcrumbs I throw out there. Um, complete tangent. So we're at the, usually at about the time where I kind of check in or check out and get back into, uh, I'm almost done with the caffeine. So I, I could keep going a little bit. I will tell you this. This week I reused a Line 6 pod to do some recording. Um, it's something that goes back to, I believe, 1997. And as guitar players, we always want like the latest gadget and the latest, greatest plug-in or amp or guitar or pedal or software. Um, and then meanwhile, you realize that like, you know, this Sansamp thing that came out in the 80s, which great guitar players loved and great producers loved then, it's still great. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, we got a little bit distracted and bored, but um, there are some phenomenally successful records on guitar that that the sand sump was used and that the pod was used. The pod is like this kidney bean looking, um, you know, multi-effect box. 
uh, I would I would I would throw the camera over there, but like that's too that's too fancy for my production. Um, so you can use old stuff again. You can you can make something out of something that's was really considered great several years ago, but then it has become like, you know, uh, not the flavor of the month. And, uh, you know, keep it under your hat. Don't tell people like, you know, oh, this is what I used. But there's some great stuff out there to like re repurpose, to use a really current word. <laughs>